Good evening and a very warm welcome to To The Point. I'm Birgit and it is so lovely to be with you for the programme this evening. And I'm so excited about the programme tonight because we'll be hearing an, ins an inspirational testimony about a life that was trapped in the supernatural and um, in the lure of drink, drugs and money. Um, later my guest found himself on a tropical island and what happened next through the drawing of the Holy Spirit transformed his life beyond recognition. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the program this evening, um, evangelist, author of Out of Darkness, uh, and founder of Lumina Ministries, George Osborne. Hello. <laughs> George, hello. welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, George, it's great to have you because you were recently with us for Halloween, and we mm -hmm. asked you the question about the occult and whether involvement in the occult was harmless fun. And actually, mm -hmm. your testimony bears witness to the fact that it's anything but harmless fun. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. And I think that was a big, big thing for me as I got out of my my um, occult, when I was trapped in the occult and I got out of that, um, one of the biggest things that I found in that was the deceiving nature of it all really. And I think Halloween can certainly be that. There's some harmless fun in it, don't get me wrong, but yeah, a lot of it's deceiving and quite dark. So well, I'm really interested yeah. to hear about your involvement in the supernatural mm -hmm. and what God did to draw you out of this. So I wonder if you take us back to the beginning and share yeah. your story. Um, so, going back to the beginning, I wasn't brought up in a Christian family. Um, my father, he was a, an alcoholic. Um, both parents loved me very much from a very sort of normal middle class background, if you like. Um, but my dad became very heavily involved in drink. In fact, just a few years ago, I found him dead. It had become such an addiction in his life. Um, but it just meant growing up, he wasn't really around to sort of discipline me. Um, so at an early age, got involved with the wrong crowd, and so from the age of about eight years old, I began smoking, and by the age of about ten, I was getting involved in sort of soft drugs, and um, but I guess it was when I was a teenager, about 12, 13 years old, somebody introduced me to a game at school called a Ouija board, mm -hmm. um, and people believe that with a Ouija board you can talk to dead spirits, and and you can contact the dead, and um, for me, I didn't believe in anything supernatural at this stage of my life. You know, as I said, I wasn't brought up in a sort of spiritual home. Um, and I thought it was all a load of rubbish. <laughs> so what was your reaction then, not believing in the afterlife and the supernatural? Mm. You started playing this game with your yeah. friends and you started to get answers to the questions that mm -hmm. you were asking. And the answers were quite accurate. Yeah. Um, I mean, initially what happened in the room, the atmosphere would, would change very quickly. Um, so we'd ask information about our family members and there was information that was coming back that well, I knew the other two in the room didn't know about. So I quickly realised, hang on a minute, this is, this is more serious, there's something supernatural happening here. Um, so just became more embroiled in asking questions and going further. Um, we'd even ask questions about, sometimes we'd think we were talking to a Second World War veteran that had died and we'd ask him his name. and what battalion he was in or whatever and then we'd go and research that and find it was accurate so we knew that the information that was coming back was was something beyond the room really. I just have a couple of questions at this mm. point George because I'm mindful that there could be people watching who yeah. um, actually relate to what you're saying. They're mm -hmm. not really familiar with Christianity but they're familiar with um, this whole aspect of, yeah. of the occult and these accurate answers coming back. Mm -hmm. As a Christian how would you explain what was happening when you were receiving these accurate um, responses. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at the Bible, I think what was probably going on is, is this is, as I get to later on in this story, I think it's demonic stuff that had tried to contact me. Mm -hmm. So I do believe there is some power there. There is some information that they've got access to that they can reveal to us supernaturally. Yeah. Um, so I think it's demonic, really. And I think the stuff that's, that's there is trying to deceive us. So whatever I was contacting, I believe, was actually trying to pull me away from God and trying to trick me that it was dead people. So I don't actually believe I was talking to, to this dead person. I believe the demonic have access to that information and were giving that to me to try and trick me away from God, really, and deceive me down that road. And so that would account for the atmosphere that you described as well, because mm. I'm sure people can relate to that as well. Yeah the kind of heaviness of the yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, the heaviness in the room. Sometimes it would go cold, you know, it'd be sort of a bit of a cliche, but we'd have a candle in the room and the candle would begin to flicker. And there was definitely something out there and it was exciting. You know, I was a teenage boy at this stage and it was quite exciting to get involved in it. And, and it seemed like innocent fun. 
the information that was coming back was helping me. I remember we'd ask things about our exam papers at school, you know, all this sort of stuff. So it was exciting, really. Um, we'd have information about friends and, you know, it gave us a little bit of credence at school as we revealed some of the stuff that we found out. And, and we just became more and more embroiled. There was another two friends with me. Um, we just became addicted. We'd play at the back of the school gates. We'd play it on the way home. We'd play it in the back of a classroom. Um, anywhere we could set this thing up, we'd try and do it. Um, and then I guess the next sort of stupid decision in my life, as I look back now, um, we became a bit frustrated with having to set up this board on a table and we thought, well, could we try and get these spirits we're talking to to somehow come inside us? And so we talked to them and on, they said that was possible. So uh, we looked fairly stupid in my friend's kitchen with a glass up against our ear and asking these spirits to come into us really yeah i'm interested george in just this mm. process that you've described it's kind of one of escalation really yeah. that you described a kind of an excitement as you're getting mm. these answers back and and actually a dependence as well that as you saw that it was actually helpful for mm. you know answers to exam questions and yeah. things it actually created more of a lure mm. um, and that's often how the enemy works yeah. actually and this sort of increasing dependence so that you're mm. actually using cigarette packets and going down to the canal yeah. and <laughs> behind the bike yeah. sheds anywhere you can yeah. to finally you come to this point where it's actually not enough mm -hmm. and you actually want the spirits that yeah. were advising you to, to come onto the inside of you. Yeah. So that's quite a, a pivotal moment really. Mm -hmm. Here you are with your friends, you're asking these spirits to come inside. What happened? Well we looked fairly daft in the, in the kitchen of this house with a glass up against <laughs> our ear and um, nothing happened initially. There were no kind of fireworks or, um, but I guess it was a few days later. Just began to hear a kind of a new inner voice, that's the way I describe it. And we all have this kind of inner dialogue that's going on within us. Um, well, it was like that, but it was a, a, a new kind of voice. And this voice was communicating with me uh, and again telling me stuff and telling me helpful things. Um, I remember we'd even go to, to shops and we'd try and steal stuff. And this voice would tell me when people were coming and when they weren't. And so it was like a, a new thing that was, it was a, like a friend really someone that I was constantly communicating with. and um, Was and it always positive mm. like that, or did it begin to change your personality in ways that weren't so positive? Well, at this stage, it was quite positive, and I thought it was helpful. Um, I thought, like, I had a new guide. You know, people often talk about spirit guides and these sorts of things. Well, that's yeah. a version of that, if you like. I had this thing that was helping me with my life, telling me what to do. Um, and at that stage, it was all pretty positive, but... I guess, ironically, it was when I got near church that things kind of turned upside down. Yeah, this is really interesting, mm. actually, because I've I've heard your testimony b before, and yeah. there's a point at which you and your friends find yourselves outside mm. of a church, and in yeah. fact, you're actually kind of throwing stones yeah. and being a nuisance. But, I mean, yeah. it's quite interesting what yeah. God did at that point. Yeah. So um, would you be able to take us to that point and yeah. share what happened? So we're outside a, a local church, um, you know, sort of stereotypical church, and we were just just trying to cause trouble, really. Um, we were throwing stones at the building, I remember we were shouting outside the building and and this this man came out from the church, there was a sort of basement youth club being run on that occasion and he walked out and um, I guess I had in my mind a sort of stereotypical image of, of Christians and this man kind of fitted that image, I always thought Christians were a bit out of touch and I say that as a Christian now. Um, but he had that kind of, that image really and he just came to talk to us but he was so lovely really as I look back you know he was really kind and he began to talk to me about Christianity what are you guys doing and he began to share a little bit about Jesus and what he was doing and, and I just gave him a really hard time. You weren't familiar with Christianity at all at this no, point were you? No okay. I mean stuff that you hear about in school but there was no background not really been to church other than weddings and things like that um, but I just gave him a really hard time and, and I remember at the end of the conversation him saying look I'd love to pray for you and I remember you know, thinking, why, is, why does he want to pray for me? You know, I'm, I'm throwing stones at the building, I'm giving him a hard time, he hasn't called the police. Um, and this guy was just a, an ordinary Christian, he wasn't you know, a full-time worker in the church or anything. Yeah. And he prayed for me, and as he prayed for me, I can't remember what he said, I don't know what words he used, but at the end of the prayer he said, in Jesus' name, and he had his hand on my shoulder, and it was at that moment that my whole body it just... There was like a, a, an, a almost like an electric shock kind of feeling, and I just tensed up, 
and he realized there's something a little bit strange going on mm -hmm. and it was then that he said look come back next week we'd love to pray for you again did you yourself think something strange was going on at the mention of the name of jesus your body actually yeah. reacting in that way i didn't know what was going on really yeah. it was yeah I, I remember it and as i look back i remember that kind of moment um and there was definitely a drawing at that moment thinking what was that about and yeah. But at this stage, I still thought, well, I had good spirits and maybe this is just another form of it. And So you went back to the church for yeah. prayer, didn't you? Yeah. What happened at that point? Um, well, that was the kind of upside down bit, really. So yeah. we'd go to the church service in the evening and then afterwards a group of people would pray for us. Um, and it would take sort of five or six people around us, you know, putting their hands on us and praying over us. And it was then that these, these spirits, or what I believe from the Bible to be demons, would actually physically take control of us. Um, strange voices would come out of my mouth, you know, eyes would be rolling. Um, and it would take people to hold us down on the ground. You know, I was still a teenager at that stage, so it was quite small. Um, and it was terrifying, really. A lot of dark stuff happened around that time. But we'd go back week by week, and really over that period it would intensify. So what I thought to be good, helpful spirits mm. suddenly became quite angry and violent that I was going near this church, that I was being prayed for. Um, and as people prayed, these, these spirits would, would scream out and I'd watch my friends go through the same sort of experience. I remember at home, um, these demons would take control of my body sometimes and my mind and I'd smash mirrors at the house and there'd be blood off my hands. I'd be writing in these strange languages. Um, there was just mm -hmm. a lot of dark stuff that you know people at my school saw it happen in parks when I was out at night. So it wasn't a kind of private thing that just happened in the church. Mm -hmm. This was quite a public public thing at the time. It's really interesting, George, actually just kind of um, hearing your testimony that mm -hmm. up, and, up until this point, the influence of these spirits had actually been what you considered to be quite positive. Yeah. But the minute that you actually start get, getting drawn mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. there's almost like this turning yeah. around and time. there's a revelation mm -hmm. of actually what these spirits mm -hmm. are about, these yeah. demonic spirits are yeah. about. You describe this sort of physical manifestation mm -hmm. and also it's a very evocative scene mm -hmm. that you just described where you actually took broken mirror glass yeah. and cut yourself and sort of yeah. um, painted with, with the blood. I mean, it's mm. it's very mm. powerful. It's a, an evocative picture of this battle that was going on at this mm -hmm. point. But things actually reached um, probably a climactic point yeah. when you were um, at a railway station mm -hmm. one evening. Would you share that experience yeah. with us? So I was chasing a friend down a railway track. We used to muck around by these railway lines. Um, and I was chasing him down this railway track at a the group of friends of mine were on this footbridge. And these demons actually physically took hold of my body and they lay me down on this um, train track. And it's hard to explain what was going on, but in my mind I, can't, I could understand what was happening, but physically I uh, couldn't move my body, so I was trapped on this railway line. And I always share that I think there's two miracles that took place, mm -hmm. because firstly people will know you should be electrocuted really when you're on a railway line. Yeah. And that's the first thing that, that didn't happen as a, as a miracle for me. Um, but the second part was there was a train coming towards me on that line and I had the friends sort of screaming down to get up and you know I thought I was going to die on that train track and I should have done really. Um, but before the train hit me it was as though someone just grabbed the hold of the back of me and just pulled me up. And I then had the, the train sort of whizzing past the front of my face and and the reason I always share that my friends are on that bridge is because they can all testify that there was there was nobody stood behind me. Yeah. There's nobody else there, you know, I believe God or an angel, what, well, I don't know, but something pulled me up off that train train. That is absolutely terrifying. I mm. mean, I can't even imagine mm. what that would have been like where you actually felt physically held down, restrained yeah. on this track. Yeah. As you say, the fact you weren't electrocuted is a miracle. Mm. But I mean, the terror that you must have been experiencing seeing this oncoming train, yeah. is that the case? Well, I remember thinking, you know, I'm going to be newspapers. You could see the local newspaper saying this this boy kills himself on a railway line. That's how it would have it would have looked like suicide. Yeah. Um, and I guess those things flash through your mind in those in those moments of, yeah. of panic, really. And but the power of God. I mean, at the mm. last moment that you yeah. actually experienced the power yeah. of God, whether it was an angel that He sent yeah. or the Holy Spirit mm. actually physically lifting you up yeah. off that track, it yeah. is absolutely astounding yeah. actually yeah. and it is interesting that your mm. friends witnessed this and they mm. could testify to the fact yeah. that there was no other human person yeah. around so yeah. that is 
actually um, mm. a divine intervention. Yeah. And I'm reminded of Psalm 91, which mm. talks about God actually giving his angels charge over us, so whether mm. it was God himself or yeah. that he sent an angel, yeah, yeah. assigned an angel to you. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. George, mm. I wonder if you could offer encouragement to somebody who's mm. watching, who just actually really needs that kind mm. of hope that mm. God is able to intervene in supernatural, miraculous Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Well, I think this, you know, this is, I've realized latterly that this is such a great picture of, of what God wants to do for everyone. Um, we might not have demons in our bodies, we might not be trapped by those things, but we can be trapped by lots of different things. Like my father with alcohol, you know, it could be a, an addiction to drugs, it could be money, it could be so many things. But God wants to take us from that place of captivity to a place of freedom, you know, from, from death to life. And God, if he can pull you off the train track, <laughs> he can do anything really, you know. So I just want to encourage people that there's power in God, there's power in the name of Jesus. Just amazing, mm. George. So at this point then, mm. um, I would imagine that you'd go back to the church to tell the person what had happened. Yeah, well, effectively, that's, yeah, exactly. That night, I was in a bit of a panic. Um, I realized this is now life and death. You know, where was I going to go if I died that night? What was going to happen to me? Um, so I ran to my Christian friend's house, that man, told him what had happened, and I said I needed help. And he said, look, We've prayed for you loads, but this has got to be a decision now that you need to make. Wow. You need to, to turn to Jesus. So for the first time, I, I guess I prayed for myself. And I was in his living room and I just looked up to, to the heavens and just said, Jesus, I'm so sorry for the things that I've done. That I've got involved in this occult stuff and I want to turn away from it. I need your help to get rid of whatever is in me. And that was such a simple prayer. But one of the things I love testifying to is, is God completely healed me that night. That moment, whatever was in me left, and I've got a letter that I wrote that man that night thanking <laughs> him so much, and it was amazing, because when I left to when I arrived, it was such a change and such a difference. And That is amazing, yeah. and actually one thing that really strikes me, George, is mm. what you described about a number of Christians praying for you over mm -hmm. the months, but mm. it was actually this point at which you, from your own heart, yeah. said this prayer to God, and it's not about mm. the words that we say, it's a heart response, yeah. and you were genuine in, in mm. um, repenting of what you'd been involved mm. in and turning to Christ, mm. and actually just that incredible experience of whatever yeah. was in you that you had invited in, mm. leaving, yeah. and then the presence of God, and what was it like to experience the presence of God living oh, on the inside yeah. of you? Well, compared to what I've been going through, it was such a difference and, yeah. and a peace, you know. And I think there was panic when I arrived at that house. This is, I could have died on that train track. I could have been lost forever. And, and I think, as you've rightly said, the key to it really was my decision, my heart. What was I giving it to? Was I giving it to this occult stuff? Was I giving it to alcohol like my dad? But it was that night saying, no, Jesus, I want you to be in control of my life. And... Yeah. That's really amazing. So at this point, George, there's actually more to your story mm. because um, you were involved in the church. And mm -hmm. um, but at a certain point, um, you actually did. Uh, there was a period of, of disillusion, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, you kind of perceived that Christianity. There were a lot of kind of rules and regulations. Would yeah. you be able to share about that? Yeah. So I started going to church after that. Um, an assembly at school. Told it was exciting times as people becoming Christians, um, and I started trying to read the Bible, and I wanted to now follow Jesus. I know what he'd done in my life and I wanted to, to try and follow him. And I guess as I started reading the Bible, I was still a teenager at this stage. And like you said, there was a lot of rules in there that I found and there was things that I, I wanted to do to try and please God. And I kept mucking up. I kept getting things wrong and I thought, well, God must be really disappointed. Um, he's done this amazing thing in my life and now here I am, I can't follow him. And I thought, well, maybe God's trying to spoil my fun a bit as well and try and take things away from me. And I began to drift away. Um, and I'm ashamed, really, as I look back. I kind of got it, got it wrong. But um, there was a girl at school, and that just seemed more appealing. And, and, yeah, I just drifted back to the family philosophy of just wanting to be happy in life and to look for whatever makes you happy. And Can I just say, George, yeah. I just so appreciate you sharing about this because I actually mm -hmm. think that many many of us could relate to that, that mm -hmm. actually God and his amazing faithfulness enters into our lives. We have these encounters, yeah. but so often, you know, the enemy does actually kind mm -hmm. of come back and, and lure us away again. Yeah. And it, it is something that we all mm -hmm. kind of struggle with at different points in our walk. So it's an amazing testimony mm -hmm. of God's grace that even through this, um, he is able time. to draw you and, and very, um, it, it's wonderful that you're actually so humble and mm -hmm. open to share it. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what happened at that, yeah. at that stage then? 
So I um, guess I grew up as an adult, did some yeah. of the normal things, went to college, um, got a job. Um, but I just remember during that sort of period, I was quite unhappy actually. Um, and always searching, there was this kind of thing inside saying, you know, there's more to life. And I remember I'd set myself sort of these targets inside. I'd say, well, if I could just get that job at work or if I could have a bit more money or if I just got that girl or whatever it was, I'd yeah. set these targets and I'd arrive at that point and then there was this thing missing and I'd become frustrated and um, I just remember thinking, well, okay, well, maybe the problem's with where I live, you know, maybe if I get out of where I live and I decided to go travelling. Uh, so I went to Thailand and I found myself on a tropical island and I thought, well, this is going to be it, you know, this is the dream, you know, this is what the world sort of throws at us. Um, we're on a bit of a cold day today, aren't we? And, <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful place, tropical weather, white beaches, palm trees, you know, something you see in the movies. It was amazing. And there I bought myself a bar and a restaurant with an old school friend. And I remember thinking, well, I've made it. You know, this is the dream. I'm living the dream. Mm -hmm. And it was probably about two or three months in. Just this, again, this thing inside saying there's more to life. Just a lack of contentment. Uh, frustration and I remember thinking if I can't get happy here what what's wrong with me and I began to realize that the problem was was inside it wasn't with what was going on around me um, I even remember at that stage going to visit some monks on the island and trying to get some answers and they kept saying you need to look within yourself and I was fast realizing the problem was actually in inside and it was I didn't have the answers yeah. um, and I decided to sell up, so I sold the bar and I came back to the UK a couple of years after that um, that time in Thailand. And I thought, I started thinking, well, maybe God, maybe mm. just maybe he does have the answers. I'd looked everywhere else. I mean, this is mm. an incredibly powerful testimony in itself mm. that you actually um, sought meaning, you sought purpose, you sought yeah. the, the big answers, basically. Yeah. And you came to what the world presents as the ultimate, this mm -hmm. idyllic yeah. island. Um, you know, you had yeah. so much had going everything. for you, everything yeah. there. Yeah. And yet there was still this, this emptiness, this yeah. sense of questioning what your life mm -hmm. was about. Yeah. And actually that the Holy Spirit was still at work drawing mm -hmm. you home, actually, yeah. drawing Absolutely. you home. So physically yeah. and spiritually yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so time. so you, you come back to the UK then mm -hmm. and um, I'm just mindful we have a few minutes left so it's incredible yeah, yeah. to hear about what yeah. Jesus did at this yeah. point yeah. you went back to the church didn't mm -hmm. you I did work brought back into that church that I've been in all those years ago uh, it was emotional for so many reasons but one of the things that I heard was the story of the prodigal son and I'm sure many people are familiar with that story but it's yeah. that boy isn't it goes off to a distant land and, and squanders his money that was me but his dad welcomes him back and he runs to his son, kisses him. I guess in that kind of moment in the church, the Holy Spirit just awakened me to what, what this was all about, that this father was God and this was the love he was offering me. And it was like he was just saying to me, look, George, I've seen everything you've done, all the good and the bad, but that thing that you've been looking for is me. It's a relationship with me. And that's why you've been incomplete. And I just sat there and I cried as I realized that, that God was welcoming me back wow. and that thing that was missing was him. And, you know, I turned to him in that service and, I, and I, I started getting answers to all those questions. I began to realize that God wasn't about rules. You know, it's like he was saying, I love you, not based on, on what you've done, because <laughs> I've made a muck up of it anyway. He was saying, I love you based on what Jesus has done. Jesus has died for your sins yeah. you're you're forgiven in him all that is washed away when you put your trust in me that is so powerful mm -hmm. now George we have less than two minutes left and mm -hmm. I have two questions for you yeah. one about your experience of Jesus Christ at that time mm -hmm. and two for anyone watching who's actually they they relate to what you're saying they actually mm -hmm. have known God but they're actually um, caught in sin and mm -hmm. uh, there's a battle going on but they yeah. really actually feel the sense of the Holy Spirit drawing them back mm -hmm. could you encourage them with, with one minute left yeah. Jesus and, and being drawn back to yeah. God yeah so I think for me, the, the biggest lesson that I learned is to keep coming back to God because yeah. we're going to keep stumbling, we're going to keep getting it wrong this side of heaven. Yeah. Um, and there's enough grace for us there. And I think Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm married now. And one of the stories I love sharing is proposing to my wife. And it's a vulnerable moment. But she said yes, and we got married. But, but Jesus does that on the cross. You know, Jesus dying on the cross is saying, I want to be in a relationship with you. 
I'll take all your stuff, I'll take all your junk, and you get all my goodness, all my perfection on you. And it's so worth it, and he's completely changed my life. And it's not that everything is rosy, there's still difficulties, but I just encourage people, keep coming back to him, keep coming back to him. George, it has been so wonderful hearing your testimony. It's extraordinary about what God has done, bringing you from the darkness into the light of his kingdom and also just the experience of his grace, um, bringing you back to this place of, of homecoming and relationship with him. George, it's been such a blessing. Thank you for joining us on To The Point. Thank you. And um, we hope the program has been a blessing to you. Thank you for being with us. In the meantime, God bless you. Bye-bye.